How you have felt, O oh men of Athens, adhering to speeches of my accusers, I cannot tell. But I know that their persuasive words almost made me forget who I was. Such was the effect of them. And yet they have hardly spoken a word of truth. But many as their falsehoods were, there was one of them which quite amazed me. I mean, when they told you to be upon your guard, and not to let yourselves be deceived by the force of my eloquence. They ought to have been ashamed of saying this, because they were sure to be detected as soon as I opened my lips and displayed my deficiency. They certainly did appear to be most shameless in saying this, unless by the force of eloquence they mean the force of truth. For then, I do indeed admit that I am a fool. But in how different a way from theirs? Well, as I was saying, they have hardly uttered a word, or not more than a word of truth. But you shall hear from me the whole truth, not, however, delivered after their manner, and a set oration duly ornamented with words and phrases. No, indeed! But I shall use the words and arguments which occur to me at the moment, for I am certain that this is right, and that at my time of life I ought not to be appearing before you, O men of Athens, in the character of a juvenile orator. Let no one expect this of me. And I must beg of you to grant me one favor, which is this. If you hear me using the same words in my defense which I have been in the habit of using, and which most of you may have heard in the Agora, and at the tables of the money changers, or anywhere else, I am more than seventy years of age, and this is the first time that I have ever appeared in a court of law, and I am quite a stranger to the ways of the palace, and therefore I would have you regard me as if I were really a stranger, whom you would excuse if he spoke in his native tongue, and after the fashion of his country. That, I think, is not an unfair request. Never mind the manner, which may be or may not be good, but think only of the justice of my cause, and give heed to that. Let the judge decide justly, and the speaker speak truly. And first, I have to reply to the older charges and to my first accusers, and then I will go on to the later ones. For I have had many accusers who have accused me of old, and their false charges have continued during many years, and I am more afraid of them than of Anitis and his associates, who are dangerous too, in their own way. But far more dangerous than these are those who began when you were children, and took possession of your minds with their falsehoods, telling of one Socrates, a wise man who speculated about the heaven above, and searched into the earth beneath, and made the worse appear the better cause. These are the accusers whom I dread, for they are the circulators of this rumor, and the hearers are too apt to fancy that speculators of this sort do not believe in the gods. And they are many, and their charges against me are, are of an ancient date, and they have made them in days when you were impressible, in childhood, or perhaps in youth, and the cause when heard went by default, but there was none to answer. And hardest of all, their names I do not know and cannot tell, unless in the chance of a comic poet. But the main body of these slanderers, who from envy and malice have wrought upon you, and there are some of them who are convinced themselves, and impart their convictions unto others. All these, I say, are the most difficult to deal with, for I cannot have them up here and examine them, and therefore I must simply fight with shadows in my own defense, and examine when there is none who answers. I will ask you then to assume with me, as I was saying, that my opponents are of two kinds, one recent, the other ancient, and I hope that you will see the propriety of my answering the latter first, for these accusations you have heard long before the others, and much oftener. Well then. I will make my defense, and I will endeavor in the short time which is allowed to do away with this evil opinion of me, which you have held for such a long time, and I hope that I may succeed if this be well for you and me, and that my words may find favor with you. But I know that to accomplish this is not easy. I quite see the nature of the task. Let the event be as God wills, in obedience to the law. I make my defense. I will begin at the beginning, and ask what the accusation is which has given rise to the slander of me which has encouraged Miletus to proceed against me. What do the slanderers say? They shall be my prosecutors, and I will sum up their words in an affidavit. Socrates is an evildoer, and a curious person, who searches into things under the earth and in heaven, and he makes the worse appear the better cause, and he teaches the aforesaid doctrines to others. That is the nature of the accusation, and that is what you have seen yourselves in the comedy of Aristophanes, who has introduced a man whom he calls Socrates going about and saying that he can walk in the air, and talking a great deal of nonsense concerning matters of which I do not pretend to know either much or little. Not that I mean to say anything disparaging of anyone who is a student of natural philosophy. 
I should be very sorry if Miletus could lay that into my charge. But the simple truth is, O Athenians, that I have nothing to do with these studies. Very many of those present are witness to the truth of this, and to them I appeal. Speak then, you who have heard me, and tell your neighbors whether any of you have ever known me to hold forth in few words or in many upon matters of this sort. You will hear their answer, and from what they say of this you will be able to judge of the truth of the rest. As little foundation is there for the report that I am a teacher, and take money, that is no more true than the other. Although, if a man is able to teach, I honor him for being paid. There's Gorgias of Leatium, and Prodicus of Sios, and Hippias of Elis, who go the round of cities, and are able to persuade the young men to leave their own citizens, by whom they might be taught for nothing, and come to them, by whom they not only pay, but are thankful if they may be allowed to pay them. There is actually a Parian philosopher, residing in Athens, of whom I have heard, and came to hear of him in this way. I met a man who has spent a world of money on sophists, Callias, the son of Hipponicus, and knowing that he had sons, I asked him, Callias, I said, if your two sons were foals or calves, there would be no difficulty in finding someone to put over them. We should hire a trainer of horses, or a farmer probably, who would improve and perfect them in their own proper virtue and excellence. But, as they are human beings, whom are you thinking of placing over them? Is there any one who understands human and political virtue? You must have thought about this as you have sons. Is there anyone? There is, he said. Who is he, said I, and of what country, and what does he charge? Evanus the Parian, he replied. He is the man, and his charge is five minae. Happy is Evanus, I said to myself, if he really has this wisdom and teaches at such a modest charge. Had I the same, I should be very proud and conceited. But the truth is that I have no knowledge of the kind, O Athenians. I dare say that some will ask the question, why is this Socrates, and what is the origin of these accusations of you? For there must have been something strange which you have been doing. All this great fame and talk about you would have never arisen if you had been like other men. Tell us then why this is, as we should be sorry to judge hastily of you. Now I regard this as a fair challenge, and I will endeavor to explain to you the origin of this name of Wise and of this evil fame. Please to attend then. And although some of you may think that I am joking, I declare that I will tell you the entire truth. Men of Athens, this reputation of mine has come of a certain sort of wisdom which I possess. If you ask me what kind of wisdom, I reply, such wisdom as is attainable by man, for to that extent I am inclined to believe that I am wise, whereas the persons of whom I was speaking have a superhuman wisdom which I may fail to describe, because I have it not to myself. And he who says that I have, speaks falsely, and is taking away my character. And here, O men of Athens, I must beg you not to interrupt me, even if I seem to say something extravagant. For the word which I will speak is not mine. I will refer to you to a wisdom who is worthy of credit, and will tell you about my wisdom whether I have any, and of what sort. And that witness shall be the god of Delphi. You must have known Charaphon. He was early a friend of mine, and also a friend of yours. For he shared in the exile of the people, and returned with you. Well, Charaphon, as you know, was very impetus in all his doings. And he went to Delphi, and boldly asked the oracle to tell him whether, as I was saying, I must beg you not to interrupt. He asked the oracle to tell him whether there was anyone wiser than I was. And the Pythian prophetess answered that there is no man wiser. Charaphon is dead himself, but his brother, who is in court, will confirm the truth of this story. Why do I mention this? Because I'm going to explain to you why I have such an evil name. When I heard the answer, I said to myself, what can the god mean? And what is the interpretation of this riddle? For I know that I have no wisdom, small or great. What then can he mean 
when he would be against his nature. After long consideration, I at last thought of a method of trying the question. I reflected that if I could only find a man wiser than myself, then I might go to the god with a reputation in my hand. I should say to him, Here is a man who is wiser than I am, but you said I was the wisest. Accordingly, I went to one who had the reputation of wisdom, and observed him. His name I need not mention, as follows. When I began to talk with him, I could not help thinking that he was not really wise. Although he was thought wise by many, and wiser still by himself, I went and tried to explain to him that he thought himself wise, but was not really wise. The consequence was that he hurt me. So I left him, saying to myself as I went away, Well, although good, I am better off than he is, for he knows nothing, and thinks that he knows. I neither know nor think that I know. In this latter particular, then, I seemed to have slightly the advantage over him. Then I went to another who had still higher philosophical pretensions, and my conclusion was exactly the same. I made another enemy of him, and of many others beside him.